We have uh, before us today, we're going to start with House File 341. Uh, Representative Fice, would you like to move 341 be re referred to the Education Policy Committee? Yes, I would, Madam Chair. So, All right. Uh, Representative Feist moves House File 341. We have several amendments this morning. I believe they are all author's amendments. Uh, so we will take care of those first. Uh, first up, we have the A1 amendment. Um, for in the interest of time, I'm just going to move the A1 amendment myself instead of kicking it over to you for every single one of these, Representative Feist. Uh, so I will move the A1 amendment uh, and then uh, we'll move the amendment to the A1 amendment. I believe there's a small oral amendment, uh, Representative Feist to the amendment to the A1 amendment, if you could explain uh, your oral amendment for the record. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. The A1 amendment is offered after conversations with the College Board to ensure that the bill does not unintentionally affect students in Minnesota from accessing post-secondary planning and supports. Um, I would like to amend the amendment at line 1.6. Um, currently, it reads that uh, express written consent is required. I would like to amend line 1.6 to read express digital or written consent. All right, any discussion uh, to the amendment to the amendment? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, those, all those opposed? All right, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Uh, so now to the underlying A1 amendment as amended, uh, Representative Feista, please uh, briefly explain your amendment. Yep, so basically um, in collaboration with the College Board, we just wanted to make sure that, um, that the students would um, uh, when they took like ACD, SAT, that this college board would be able to, you know, approach them with scholarships and, and educational supports based on their scores. And so um, that is why we made this amendment. All right. Sounds good. Any discussion to the A1 amendment as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A1 as amended is adopted. Uh, we will move on to the A2 amendment. I will move uh, the A2 amendment. Representative Feist, uh, please explain the A2. Yes, so the A2 amendment was made in collaboration with school stakeholders to clarify language around remote access um, to school issued devices for non-commercial educational purposes in instances where the device is stolen and where it is required to comply with federal or state law or to participate in federal or state funding programs. All right, any discussion to the A2 amendment? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A2 amendment is adopted. Moving on to the A3. I will move the A3 amendment and I can actually explain this one. It's just updating the effective dates because this bill was introduced last year. Uh, any discussion to the A3? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A3 amendment is adopted. And finally, the A4 amendment, I will move the A4 amendment and Representative Feist, a brief description of the A4, please. Yes, the A4 amendment takes non-public schools out of coverage by the bill. This decision was made because the constitutional issues are not the same for non-governmental actors and students at non-public schools don't have to choose between their privacy and a K-12 education. They have the option to switch to a public school if they prefer. All right, uh, any discussion to the A4 amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A4 amendment is adopted. Uh, your bill is now in the shape that you would like it to be in, Representative Feist. Thank you for your quick uh, descriptions of the bills. And with that, I will... Uh, Representative Feist uh, renews her motion that House File 341 as amended be referred to the Education Policy Committee. And now you can present your bill. Uh, Representative Feist, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just mention that we are also working on a handful of technical edits um, in response to some helpful input by data privacy experts. Um, those will be pretty technical. 
Um, so I am thrilled to be presenting the Student Data Privacy Act to the Judiciary Committee today. This bill recently passed out of the Bipartisan Bicameral Commission on Data Practices with full unanimous support. This act originally was introduced in 2015 and over the years has been amended to thoughtfully incorporate feedback from stakeholders. The version before you today is a reasonable, targeted bill crafted to achieve its goal, to bring our student data privacy laws into the 21st century. As a mother of a 10 and 11 year old, I have been inundated with demands by my kids schools that I sign up for numerous external vendors. Through these portals and programs and cloud databases, my children interact on camera with peers and upload their writing projects and photos of their belongings and our home. Last summer, my daughter continued to access her school created Google Doc to work on her epic magic mermaid saga. Uh, I have no idea who reads her mermaid stories besides me and when this content will be destroyed, if ever. I also have no idea where or if photographs photographs of our home and my children are saved somewhere and who has access to that data. I've also seen firsthand how companies profit off of our children's educational data. My daughter's class used an in-class math game that relentlessly marketed to the children to pressure their parents for a paid subscription. My, we finally gave in and found out that our daughter's in-class version of the game would incorporate new princess dresses and a fancy home. In addition, uh, sorry, we were mortified that this, the way this would impact classmates without paid subscription. In addition, a recent study found that this particular program does not enhance enhance math preparedness and rather serves only to increase screen time for kids. This incident illustrates clearly why our data privacy laws need to address the modern realities of how technology providers profit off of our kids' data. You received written testimony today from Minnesota mother who, is requested, who requested the data maintained by her child's school only to find out that amongst the countless documents and photographs and videos were photographs of her bedroom and clips of her yoga videos. The amount and type of data modern day schools now interact with is mind boggling. And yet the laws designed to protect this data envisions it as exclusively pieces of paper in a locked filing cabinet. The status quo is the wild west when it comes to protecting student data. If we are to believe the principle that our children do not shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate, then we must do better. We must protect access to data and the unscrupulous use of data to target our children for profit. We must protect children from unconstitutional and unequal surveillance that has already led to discriminatory disciplinary actions against students of color and has undermined the ability of mental health professionals to affect Effectively reach and help students in need. The pandemic and the resulting sudden and dramatic expansion of remote learning has exacerbated an already urgent situation and the time to act is now. The Student Data Privacy Act will create uniformity of protections for our students as follows. First, the bill requires that contracts between schools and external technology providers include provisions that will protect access to student data, destroy data upon conclusion of the contract, and that breaches will be disclosed. Second, the bill limits school surveillance of student activities on school issued devices. Notably, numerous exceptions to this provision are incorporated into the bill, including where surveillance is necessary to respond to an imminent threat of life to life or safety. Lastly, this bill would limit the ability of external technology providers to utilize student data for a commercial purpose, including but not limited to marketing or advertising to a student or a parent. I look forward to this discussion of this important bipartisan effort to update Minnesota's student data privacy laws to the modern world. This bill exemplifies good governance, principled support for students' and parents' constitutional rights, the ongoing effort to ensure that all children in Minnesota have the same educational resources and protections, and it draws a line in the sand that says our children's data is not for sale. It has been a privilege to work on this bill alongside its supporters, including the ACLU of Minnesota, Education Minnesota, the Student Data Privacy Project, and local nonprofit Youth Prize, which advocates for Minnesota students and youth. Thank you for taking the time to hear this bill today. Uh, thank you, Representative Feist. And I know that this has been uh, an effort years in the making that I believe Representative Lucero has been uh, working on as well. Uh, with that, we'll go to the testifiers. Um, for our testifiers, there are a lot of you today. And in order to respect your fellow testifiers, uh, so that everybody has an equal amount of time. You will each get two minutes. So if you can try uh, to keep to the point and keep focused, uh, we would all really appreciate that. Uh, first on the list, I have uh, Rich Neumeister. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. 
Good morning, <clears throat> Madam Chair. My name is Rich Neumeister. I have interacted with uh, Representative Feist over the last several weeks. I shared with her uh, some detail, some technical and some that people might say is technical, but still can have an impact on the bill. And those are the four areas. I won't get into the technical things uh, that I've suggested, but at least four areas. I'm, I'll be referring to the bill as introduced. Two of those issues are definitional. If you take a look at uh, lines one through eight through 111, there's a change of the definition of educational data. Why this concerns me is that definitions are an op are a very strong part of operations of a, to understand a statute. This particular definition has been part of law for 40 years. The additional language that is added is already covered under current law. And so based on my experience of uh, 40 plus years of interacting with language, particularly with a statute such as the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, I would suggest to keep the current definition. And I know that there are other parties that have shared that concern with Representative Feist, and that's still, I guess, an ongoing issue. The second item, the parent definition. The parent definition is, is distinctly different than, than the federal law that's being proposed in the state law. And maybe Representative Feist can talk about that, but the federal definition, again, has been around a long time. And it allows for a greater uh, situation where people that may act as parents may not have the legal authority, but can access uh, the, the students, uh, students' data. Number three is an area that I just, um, particularly when you look at uh, lines 3.25 and 4.8. There are a lot of things that new, new laws, new accountabilities, new things that parents are need to be uh, torn, uh, told about. One of the things that I feel in that section, there is not a strong uh, notice that should be given. I think there can be language adopted that says this notice that's gonna be given to parents and students too, must be, must be conspicuous, must be outside of the general, in the handbook that's generally distributed, separate somehow, some way, so that parents know this important part of law that's being adopted. Uh, as Representative Feist indicated, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, and the fourth point is that, and I shared this with Representative Feist, and particularly when she was making comments, again, to illustrate how important this is and all the obligations that are going to be done, I've asked myself, how is it going to be enforced? How is it going to be the school district and going to be able to know if things are happening? So I am suggesting some type of auditing, reporting uh, be, be done. I know that with the points that I've raised, uh, Representative Feist, Madam Chair, has indicated that it was not able to come to this first stop and that at the next stop at the Education Committee, some of those concerns might be more smoothed out or adopted or whatever. So Madam Chair, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to share my concerns and some of those items that are still ongoing. Yep, uh, thank you for your testimony. I will note for our other testifiers, that was like four minutes, uh, but I know that Mr. Neumeister has been working on this quite a bit uh, and so allowed him to, to go over his, his full testimony. Uh, moving on, we will go to uh, Andrew Liddell. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, introduce yourself for the record, and then go ahead with your testimony. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Representatives. Uh, my name is Andrew Liddell, and uh, I'm a technology lawyer and digital rights activist from Austin, Texas, where I live with my wife and two young kids. And I'm here today to testify in favor of uh, HF 341. I co-founded the Student Data Privacy Project, which is a grassroots parent effort to understand what information is being collected about our kids by tech vendors and what is being done with it. 
Last year, we coordinated an effort by 14 families in nine states to exercise their information access rights under the 1974 federal FERPA law. And what we learned was shocking. Despite clear requirements to make this information available to parents upon request and to limit to whom that information is given and how it can be used, not a single school district from Alaska to Maryland gave parents the information they're legally entitled to within the time limits required by law. Here in Minnesota, as Representative Feist mentioned, one family received over 2,000 files about their young daughter, representing just a small portion of what was requested, but which included such things as baby pictures, videos of her in an online yoga class, her artwork, and answers to in-class questions. The family was given no information about how long this information was to be stored, to whom it was disclosed, or for what purposes it was being used. Today's digital products, including those used in school, collect a staggering amount of information about their users. This includes grades for every assignment and disciplinary records going back to kindergarten. It includes every search, every website you visit, and every person you interact with. It also includes every mouse movement, how long you linger on an image. Truly, every single thing you do on a computer, all of this information is fed into an algorithm that is used to build a digital model of you. This digital you not only determines what you experience in the digital world, but also what opportunities you have in the real world. And everything a child does on a computer for the 13 years they're in school is subject to being collected in this way. And while this vast trove presents risks for hackers, I'm most concerned about how the currently legal uses of this information are shaping this generation of young people. These digital models of our kids are used in life-altering ways, including to determine which students will be recruited by a selective college and which will be referred to the local police. Currently, there are no practical limits to how this information is used and no assurances that this information is accurate before it is disclosed to those who make profound decisions about our kids' futures. HF 341 creates a healthier digital ecosystem for the school children of Minnesota. By legislating that student data is not the property of technology vendors and limiting how that data can be used, and by sharply curtailing the surveillance of students, this bill safeguards the freedom and self-determination of the children of your state. I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, I have Julia Decker. Uh, if you can unmute yourself, introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Julia Decker, Policy Director for the ACLU of Minnesota. We are here to testify in support of HF 341 as an urgently needed step in the right direction towards protecting student data privacy in Minnesota. We're really grateful to Representative Feist for chief authoring this bill and to Representatives Lucero and Representative Scott for their ongoing work and expertise in this subject area. As you've heard, HS 341 promotes transparency for students and their parents around technology that schools are using. It limits what schools and tech companies can do with student information, and it prohibits the use of certain technologies that present the most egregious threats to civil liberties. This bill has been a work in progress for a number of years now, but the move to remote learning during COVID-19 has renewed focus on the issue. The reality is that new technology with serious implications for civil liberties is being deployed and developed far more rapidly than laws can keep up with. And by the time decision makers such as the legislature try to grapple with this, it's virtually impossible to pull the technology back because it has become so pervasive. Just because technology is making it easier and easier to do things that can infringe, encroach on, and even violate civil liberties, that should not translate to a meek acceptance that civil liberties are thereby diminished or downsized as a result. So ACLU of Minnesota urges you to pass HF 341 to update the guardrails for students' data privacy and to do so this session, but we also urge you to explore forward-looking oversight and transparency mechanisms in order to move Minnesota's stance on technology and data privacy from reactive to proactive. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, I have Sarah Cluck. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning. Hello and happy Tuesday. My name is Sarah Cluck and I'm the direct, Senior Director of Education Policy at the Software and Information Industry Association, a nonprofit trade association representing education technology companies. I'm the proud graduate of Minnesota's public schools and the daughter of a retired paraprofessional in District 834, as well as a former fellow at the U.S. Department of Education focusing on the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is, um, uh, has already been mentioned many times here. But let me give you a little bit of background on FERPA. Um, it is a federal law which protects student data privacy in the classroom. In the vast majority of situations, there is typically a contract between a technology company and a school whenever that technology company has access to student data. 
FERPA requires data accessed by technology companies to only be used for the purpose it was disclosed and that data remain under the direct control of the school. If a tech company does not abide by that contract with the school that outlines these provisions required by FERPA, then the school could be banned um, from using that tech for five years. No tech company, um, and speaking on behalf of my te the tech companies that I represent, no tech company wants a press release out there saying that their product was banned from a school for five years. I appreciate the leadership of Representative Feist and Lucero and Scott on, to protect student data privacy in Minnesota. I've testified on this bill several times over the years and appreciate the work being done to refine the bill. I still have certain some concerns about certain sections um, that are as written, so I'm happy to work with the sponsors to find consensus on this. Um, a couple of examples, I remain concerned about the, as introduced, lines 323 um, and 324, which require technology companies to make security procedures available as public data. Uh, making those security procedures available as public data increases the risk of a security incident that could put student data across Minnesota at risk. I also am concerned about lines 4.13 to 4. Three, uh, which allow a parent or student to, effect, uh, to effectively opt out of certain technology providers in the classroom. This provision could place an undue burden on Minnesota's teachers, requiring them to learn and use different tools for every student in a class. To paint a picture, if this law was in effect in April 2020, you may have seen teachers needing to hold a math class on Zoom for one group of students, on WebEx for another group of students, on Google Hangouts for another group of students. You get the picture. Uh, this would place an incredible burden on Minnesota's teachers and stretch the already limited time they have. There's a few other areas of concern, but knowing that I only have two minutes, I just wanted to outline that. Thank you for your time and um, happy to happy to see everyone's smiling faces this Tuesday morning. Thank you for your testimony. And I know um, for folks who do have feedback, I know that Representative Vice is dedicated to making sure that this is the best bill it can be. Uh, so keep having those conversations because this is going to education policy. Uh, next up, I have Anthony Padernos. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Good morning. Uh, myself and Eric Simmons will be jointly doing this testimony. Uh, good morning. I'm Anthony Patternis, the Executive Director of Technology for Osseo Area Schools. My colleague Eric Simmons and I are happy to be here today on behalf of K-12 education technology leaders from across Minnesota. As members of MASA, the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, and the statewide Minnesota K-12 Technology Leadership Group to share with you our thoughts around this proposed bill. As we shared with the Legislative Commission on Data Practices in October, K-12 education technology leaders across the state have a common interest in securing the privacy and data of our students, staff, and families. We agree with the intent and parts of this bill and are strong supporters of providing greater protections by holding technology vendors accountable and to high standards for ensuring privacy and data security. We have partnered with Representative Feist around the language of this bill and want to thank her for continuing to work with us. Our group appreciates the amended changes, including language around E-rate mandates and lost stolen district technologies. However, we continue to have challenges with the current language as it relates to the duty as school districts we have for educating students and providing a safe and welcoming environment. Minnesota districts have board policies, state laws, federal laws, and codes of ethics regarding how we as school districts and district employees are responsible for ensuring data privacy and protections. Many examples that have come up in the media over the years relating to technology use overreach by school officials are often already prohibited by these policies and laws. They are often examples of employee misuse of digital tools rather than districts authority to access digital information. I would like to hand it over to Eric Simmons to provide more detail around our primary concerns with this bill as currently proposed. Good morning and thank you, Chair Beckerfin and representatives. Um, I'm Eric Simmons, Director of Technology at Chistago Lake School District. Um, as my colleague Anthony Paternos introduced, uh, pre-K through 12 education leaders continue to have concerns for both the school issued device monitoring and opt out sections of this bill. It conflicts with our day-to-day -day operations and conflicts with our charge to use student learning data in a positive way to support every student across the state. 
First, this bill's proposed opt-out provisions for technology would create major disruptions to basic school functions that are not feasible. For example, most aspects of school management, like report cards, um, transcripts, GPA, GPA calculations, class ranks, and even scheduling students into classes occurs within a school information system and often more than one that um, needs to talk with one another. For teachers using digital curriculum, student opt-outs would require alternative lesson plans and content. The burden of alternatives for opted out students would fall on teachers to consider daily a second set of lesson plans for students who have opted out of specific tools. If the opt outs actually secured student data, these challenges may be worth it. However, student opt outs have no bearing on the overall security of our school data. In the school issued device section, the bill restricts technology providers from monitoring student use, which we agree with, but the bill also extends restrictions to school personnel, which would put Minnesota students at a disadvantage. We support restricting technology providers, but school personnel also bear responsibilities that vendors do not have. We must maintain safe and supportive learning environments, help students develop responsible digital citizenship habits, and enforce our acceptable use policies. The language of this bill would prohibit school employees from investigating student inappropriate use, behavior, cyberbullying, and other non-criminal matters by using warrants or life-threatening emergencies as the standards for looking into student misconduct. Unfortunately, behavior or peer misconduct that does not reach these levels is a very often occurrence in our school systems. Finally, the Minnesota Safe and Supportive Schools Act requires schools to investigate and respond to acts of cyberbullying. It specifically calls out the need for schools to investigate when student technology use off the school premises impacts student learning during the school day and conflicts with this bill. We do share common interests in protecting student data privacy, and we support protecting student data privacy in a matter that does not severely restrict the other aspects of our charge in education. We appreciate Representative Feist's time discussing challenges and a start towards amendments. Um, we continue to have challenges with this bill as it relates to the duty we have for educating all students and providing a safe learning environment. Thank you, Jeb becker and the rest of this committee for your time. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Tyler Dyer. Uh, if you could introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Yes, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tyler Dears and I serve as the Midwest Executive Director for TechNet. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. We are a, a technology trade association, and I'm here before in opposition to House Bill 341, again, as stated previously, as introduced. Um, TechNet and our member companies that operate in the student data technology space agree with Representative Feist that student data privacy is a priority, which is why we have worked diligently with policymakers and states across the country to ensure that student data privacy is protected. Um, as drafted, uh, the bill does introduce several overbroad definitions. For example, commercial purposes uh, is not defined beyond including, but not limited to marketing or advertising to a student or parent. Uh, we believe that with this little guidance in the bill, the burden to determine what constitutes as commercial purposes um, will be shifted onto technology providers to decipher, but with no guarantee that they make the right, make the right call. Additionally, under the bill, a technology provider is required to not sell, share, or disseminate educational data unless agreed upon with a public educational agency or institution. Again, there are numerous acceptable examples of when student data could need to be shared, including scholarships, college applications, and more. We believe this provision, again, places a burden on the tech provider to determine this criteria with limited and unclear guidance. And it's our belief that schools should be able to use educational technology solutions to improve student educational outcomes. We are concerned that the language found in this bill could ultimately limit student access to these solutions. And lastly, we would also concur and share the same concern that was mentioned uh, to Sarah's point on the requirement to establish written procedures uh, that would be considered public information unless otherwise classified. We remain committed to working with representative and related committees to identify a legislative solution that protects student data privacy. We would strongly recommend that this body look at SOPIPA, a uh, model that has been enacted in 34 other states and includes several strong protections, such as the banning of sale of student data and targeted advertising in these services, requiring strong security procedures and practices, and the deletion of student data upon request by school. In addition, the model legislation actually, we believe, creates broader protections than what is included in the current draft. Thank you in advance for the consideration of these matters. We look forward to discussing with them uh, in detail in the future. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, with that, members, that wraps up uh, our public testimony of folks who signed up. Uh, we'll move on to member discussion, but first, uh, Representative Feist, if you want to respond to any of the testimony from the last couple of minutes, uh, please go ahead. 
Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for the, the helpful input from the community, experts, stakeholders. Um, and thank you to those who have already worked with me um, to, to amend the language as, as we are able to do and still in keeping with the purpose of this bill. Um, this is a really important bill and it's a very bold bill, but it's also a bill that has been around for the last, I believe, six years. And many stakeholders have had the opportunity to provide input. Um, so while I understand that this bill re represents you know, change and it will create some requirements for the stakeholders, I am completely comfortable with that. This bill is really important and it is time sensitive. Um, regarding the opt-out provisions, these used to be opt-in and it was in accommodation to the school stakeholders that we changed it to opt out. In addition, there is language that says if applicable. So there are certain circumstances where opting out is impractical and we understand that. Um, ultimately, we don't believe that parents are going to opt out in droves, um, but the fact that Education Minnesota supports this bill tells me that teachers are not concerned that they might have to adapt their lesson plans um, to, to the changing world, which they already have um, so magnificently. Um, next, I just want to um, emphasize that schools can take possession of devices and search them. This bill does not impact that. What we don't want to do is have students being under constant surveillance um, remotely. And so I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, and lastly, uh, I understand that this might create some requirements and burdens on tech providers, and I'm comfortable with that. This bill is really important. It achieves an important goal of protecting our students, and Minnesota can take the lead and be bold and, and take this important step. Um, so I appreciate all the input. I'm definitely happy to have conversations with folks. Um, I'm willing to put in the effort. I've got a spreadsheet. I'm very organized. Um, so people are welcome to reach out to me. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Representative Feist. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And I want to thank um, Representative Feist for her hard work on this. She has been far more patient than most people <laughs> probably could have been um, with this issue. Like she said, she's very organized. She has a spreadsheet with everybody's concerns, who has the concerns, and she's been very accommodating. But what she just said is accurate. When it gets right down to it, this is about protecting students and empowering parents. And so if tech providers, if some of the schools have concerns, this bill used to be what? Um, I wish Representative Lucero was still um, uh, on our committee, but it used to be, I don't know, 15, 16 pages, and it's been whittled down to a few. So this bill has already been um, uh, sliced and diced. Um, and I don't know from a perspective to reach the goal of protecting students and empowering parents, I don't know what else really can be done except for some technical changes. And so I want to thank her for her work on this. I know she'll continue to be open to work with others. Um, but the bottom line is she is not going to compromise what this bill ultimately is supposed to accomplish. And so, you know, um, People don't always get their way around here because sometimes there's a priority higher than, than pleasing certain groups. So thank you, Representative Feist, for what you're doing and keep up the good work. Uh, thank you, Representative Scott. And I do think, uh, so as chair of the Data Practices Commission, you know, there are very few things um, that, uh, that move in this body in any, uh, any commission or council or task force where we have bicameral uh, bipartisan support, and this this was a bill that we we all agreed on, and the commission just to remind folks: uh, Representative Kerr, Representative Scott, uh, Representative Lucero, and then um, our our house house delegation to the Data Practices Commission, and uh, really appreciate the full uh, testimony and discussions that we had in that uh, in that commission as well. Uh, members, is there any more discussion to the bill? I think Representative Scott and Feist uh, summarized this uh, very well. It's been going on for a very long time. So uh, with that, uh, any uh, quick closing comments, Representative Feist, now you just had the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just think that COVID has made it clear we absolutely must protect student data. Um, we need to be thinking proactively about the way that we surveil students when they're on school issue devices. Um, and it's just really important that we protect children and their emerging digital, digital lives to get something done. I'm really, really proud to be working on this bill with so many stakeholders, and uh, I would urge you to support it. 
All right, with that, Representative Feist renews her motion that House File 341, as amended, uh, be referred to the Education Policy Committee. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Yes. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Yes. Representative Feist. Yes. Representative Frazier. Yes. Representative Grossel. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Fart. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Representative Zhang. That is 16 ayes and no nays. Uh, the, the motion prevails. Uh, House File 341 as amended is on its way to education policy.